Welcome back, everybody. Uh, so this PowerPoint uh, that we have here, uh, as you can see, is fairly long. So I'm going to be splitting it up uh, into a couple different videos uh, because it is comprised of two different chapters. Uh, chapters uh, two, which goes over some general chemistry review and water chemistry. And then chapter three, which goes over the introduction to the uh, biological macromolecules. Uh, so let's get started with the review of uh, some basic chemistry. Uh, so some of you have already seen this uh, in high school chemistry, or if you're concurrently taking uh, a chemistry class right now, uh, this is gonna be review for you. Uh, but it is important to cover the general chemistry, basically the, the, the basic chemistry uh, concepts because we're going to be talking about a lot of different biological reactions uh, that occur to ensure that an organism uh, survives. So it's pretty important to understand the concepts uh, of chemistry and to make sure that you uh, have a good understanding of them uh, by the end of uh, this video and then also when you're sitting and you're reviewing. All right, so uh, as always, we have the learning objectives uh, for you written out. So you should be able to, by the end of these uh, series of videos for chapters two and three, be able to explain uh, all of these different concepts uh, in your own words uh, and explain it in a way uh, to someone that does not have a, for example, background uh, in the uh, sciences. So that's always a good way. Uh, I think that if you can teach it uh, to someone, then you have a really good understanding of it. So basically, if you can teach it, then you know it. All right, so uh, let's go back to a quick review of the hierarchy that I stated and I talked about uh, last time. Uh, we know that the smallest substances uh, that we that anything can be broken down to, uh, natural chemistry is by or by ordinary chemical means is an atom. An atom comes together to form a molecule. A molecule will then come together to form a macromolecule. So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, in these uh, couple of videos uh, through chapter throughout chapter three. Then we know that the macromolecules will then come together to form the organelles. The organelles come to form the cells. The cells of the same type will form tissue. Tissue comes together to form organs. And then the organs come together to form an organ system. For example, this is the stomach, and then this is the digestive system. And then finally, all the organ systems come together to form an organism, and in this case, a human. All right. So we'll start off with a basic definition, and that is matter. Matter is defined as anything that occupies space and has mass. Matter can be divided into three different states on our planet, and you can find matter in a solid state, you can find matter in a liquid state, and you can find matter in a gaseous state. Matter is composed of atoms. And we're going to be talking about the atoms, but atoms are defined as substances that cannot be broken down into smaller substances by ordinary chemical or physical means. That means in a normal chemistry lab or in a biology lab, we will not be able to break down atoms. That's the smallest substance that you're going to be able to see. So when we talk about atoms, atoms basically are composed of three main subatomic particles that you are all aware of and heard of, I'm sure. You have the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons. In the nucleus of the atom, you're going to find the proton. And the proton basically is the subatomic particle that has a positive charge. The neutron is also found in the nucleus of the atom, and that has a neutral charge. So it's a no charge or zero 
charge. In the orbitals, that means outside of the nucleus, so here's the nucleus, outside the nucleus, orbiting around the nucleus, you have the subatomic particles known as electrons. And the electrons have a negative charge. And if you look at the size, you can see that it is very, very small compared to the proton and the neutron. All right, so when we have the specific types of atoms, those are going to be described as elements. So in the atoms, when we look at the periodic table, which we're going to be discussing in a little bit, you have what's known as an atomic number. And the atomic number is going to be the number that gives you the number of protons in an atom, the number of protons in an atom. And that is going to be the atomic number. The atomic mass is going to be the average weight of the subatomic particles in the element. And usually, it is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons in an atom. Another definition that I want to put out there for you is what's known as the isotope. The isotope is basically an element that has a different neutron number. So it can be, for example, carbon, uh, ordinary carbon-12 versus uh, ordinary, uh, the isotope carbon-14. And basically, the difference is in the number of neutrons. Okay. So again, if you look here, we have the atomic number. So that's going to tell us what? Exactly. It's going to tell us the number of protons in the element or atom. Then we have the atomic mass. And what's that going to be equal to? The number of protons plus the number of neutrons. In this case, Hydrogen is very unique because hydrogen does not have any neutrons. All right, so let's talk about this periodic table of elements. It's an amazing uh, cheat sheet. It organizes all the elements known to man, uh, either naturally occurring, occurring elements or uh, synthesized uh, elements. And you can see that it is arranged in a certain way. There's different colors here, so on and so forth. Uh, and we're going to be covering that in a little bit. So I want to talk about the elements uh, that are found in life. And there are six elements that are found uh, in life that, are, that make up 96.6% .6 of an organism. And those elements are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Those six elements comprise 96.6% of the organism. And it is in humans, uh, and again, a lot of uh, other organisms out there, mostly organisms uh, that are found on our planet. Okay, so let's move on to a little talk about chemistry. Uh, so again, continuing with the atoms, the, the subatomic particle that we're going to focus on uh, is the electron. And we know that the electrons are organized in shells around the uh, nucleus of the atom. And these shells have specific number 
of electrons within them. The first shell can only hold a maximum of two electrons. The first shell can only hold a maximum of two electrons. The second, third, fourth, so on shells uh, remaining in all the uh, elements or atoms, they can hold up to eight electrons. A very important concept that you need to know and be familiar with is what's known as the octet rule. The octet rule states that an atom will be stable if its orbitals are full. Why the octet, octet meaning eight, it is the number of electrons, the maximum number of electrons you can have in the shells two through uh, whatever, eight, nine, okay? Uh, in biology, we usually concern ourselves up to the uh, fourth electron shell. In order to have an atom obtain stability, because we know that if we go back to the periodic table, we're gonna see that a lot of these elements do not have the maximum number of electrons in their shell. There's only one group, one group of elements in the entire periodic table that satisfy the octet rule. And we call these the noble gases. They are the inert gases. Inert because they have no desire to react because they have filled the electron shells with the maximum number of electrons. They are helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. Okay, uh, these are the six noble that are present naturally on planet Earth. They have satisfied their valence electron levels, which we're going to talk about in a second. Helium having two is the maximum we can hold. Then neon eight, argon eight, krypton eight, xenon eight, and then radon eight. Okay, so if the atom goal is to obtain stability, how is an atom that has an extra electron in its outermost shell or a missing electron in its outermost shell going to gain stability and satisfy the octet rule. And the way that the atoms or elements do that is by forming bonds. They form bonds. So here's a image depicting the uh, basically the Bohr diagram for uh, atoms, showing you the nucleus of the atom and then the uh, level, electron levels. Okay, so basically you can see that when you have an electron in the shell and you only have one and you can have a maximum of two, you know that it is unstable, okay? If you look at helium, which remember it is the inert gas, you can see that it has a maximum of two and it does have the two, the full complement it can possibly carry. It is stable, it is happy, it is in utopia. So hydrogen, wants to be like helium. It wants to have and satisfy the octet rule. Same thing for nitrogen. So you can see nitrogen is missing one, two, three electrons. So it's gonna do something to obtain those three electrons. And if you look at neon, first electron shell, maximum of two, it's satisfied. Second, maximum of eight, and it's satisfied. So again, neon and helium, 
are happy because they are the inert or noble gases. All right, so let's take a break and just a little bit of definition. Okay, uh, you can define a molecule as uh, two atoms, whether they're the same or different, coming together. Uh, a compound is two atoms where there are different elements coming together. Okay, all compounds are molecules, but not all molecules are compounds. So take a look at that, go back to that, uh, follow along uh, when you are going through your notes, if you're gonna print them out and you're taking notes. So be sure to understand the difference between a molecule and a compound. All right, so how do we form molecules? Molecules are formed by bonds, okay? So we're going up to the next level. We're taking atoms and we're introducing a new characteristic. And basically now you have what's known as a molecule. So now we have something present that was not present in the previous level. So when you had the atoms, there were no bonds. Now the molecules have bonds in them. And we're gonna be talking about three different types of bonds uh, today and throughout the semester, I'm going to be continuing our discussion of bonds because we are going to be discussing very important concepts of building bonds and then breaking bonds. And that's what we call, if you remember when we reviewed earlier, uh, that is what's known as metabolism. So your metabolism and organism metabolism is super, super important. All right, so the difference here, you can see a covalent bond is going to be a sharing of electrons. So for the bond to form, the atoms must share their electrons. So you can imagine if they're sharing, that's gonna be a very strong bond. As opposed to an ionic bond where you have transfer of electron. You, ha you have one atom that is giving up an electron, and then you have one atom that will be obtaining an electron. And we can talk about ionic bonds, and ionic bonds are uh, pretty weak because we can dissolve those in, yes, you guessed it, water. All right, so the electron shells are gonna determine the number of bonds. Remember, we gotta look at the shells. Electrons, their goal is to be in utopia. They wanna be like the noble gases. Unfortunately, on their own, they cannot, but if they work together, they can obtain utopia, okay? So they want to fill their electron shells with the maximum number of electrons that is possibly allowed. All right, so how is that going to occur? Yes, we are going to form bonds to fill the vacancies. What vacancies? Again, look, this is empty. It wants one, three. It wants three. It needs three to be stable, okay? So covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are bonds formed by the sharing of electrons. And as I stated, it is the strongest type of bond, okay? Because you have two atoms that are sharing their electron, okay? So you can see uh, the different types of covalent, covalent bonds that we can form. We can have a single covalent bond, we can have a double covalent bond, and we can even have a triple covalent bond. Yes, there are atoms that can form triple covalent bonds, okay? So we're gonna be talking about how that occurs. So a very important concept that you need to be aware of that we will talk about not only in this chapter, but in upcoming chapters uh, six and seven and eight when we talk about energy, 
cellular respiration and photosynthesis is the concept of electronegativity. Electronegativity is defined as an electron, I'm sorry, an atom's affinity for the electrons. What that means is an atom that is very close to satisfying the octet rule, that means filling its outer electron shells, is going to want to keep the electrons closer to it when a bond is formed. Okay, again, you take an atom. For example, we have oxygen here. Oxygen is atomic number eight. It has two electrons in the first shell and then six electrons in the second electron shell. How many electrons does it need to be stable? The answer is, yes, you're right, two. It is two, okay? So it needs two electrons to be stable. So when it obtains those electrons, it is going to hold the electrons closer to it. Okay, the oxygen is going to hold the electrons closer to it than hydrogen would because oxygen wants the electrons more. This electronegativity results in what's known as polarity. Polarity basically is where you have charges present. So, if you look at the general rule, an atom with more protons is more electronegative and it gets a slightly negative charge. An atom with fewer protons is less electronegative and gets a slightly positive charge. Okay? So, uh, let's take a look at this. So, polarity, all right, if we look at carbon, carbon has an atomic number of six. Carbon's happy. Carbon is unique because it can form four bonds, okay? But the bonds that are going to form are going to be equal bonds. So you have a 90 degree angle. So take a look, carbon to hydrogen, carbon to hydrogen. If you measure the bond angle, it's 90 degrees. Therefore, no charges would form. As opposed to the water molecule, the oxygen is going to want to carry or keep the electrons closer to it. Therefore, you create polarity. The, the electrons are gonna be closer to oxygen, therefore you're going to have the slightly negative charge on oxygen, and we're gonna call that partial negative, partially negative oxygen. And then you have, if you have a negative charge, then that means you have to have a positive charge, therefore, these hydrogens are going to be partially positive. All right. So, with the ability of a water molecule to have polarity due to the electronegativity of the oxygen atom, you are able to form hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonding is the most amazing property of water 
molecules because individual water molecules can come together and be attracted to one another, resulting in what we call the hydrogen bond. So hydrogen bonds really aren't bonds, uh, but they're so important to water and life that we call them hydrogen bonds. But they are really just weak attractions between positive and negative charges of polar molecules. So a water molecule can form a hydrogen bond with another water molecule or a another polar molecule. All right, so let's move on to ionic bonds. Ionic bonds basically are what? That's right, if you look at the previous PowerPoint, it is where you have a bond formed by the transfer of electrons. The big example that we use to describe ionic bonds is the formation of sodium chloride. Table salt. You have an atom of sodium and you have an atom of chlorine. Sodium has one electron in its outermost shell and chlorine has seven electrons in its outermost shell. So it's missing one and sodium has an extra one. What's gonna happen? Sodium is going to donate its electron to chlorine. Therefore, if it loses the electron, it's gonna become more positive. So that results in an ion. So you create a sodium ion, which is positive. And then the chlorine is going to gain the electron. Therefore, it is going to become more negative. And with chemistry nomenclature, the chlorine becomes chloride. So here we go, describing it. You have the sodium giving or donating the electron to chloride, to chlorine, excuse me. Then you have sodium, which is positively charged, and you have chloride, which is negatively charged, and you have sodium chloride, which forms a sodium chloride crystal lattice, which is the grain of salt that you see. Okay, ions. So some definitions. When a atom gains an electron, it becomes negatively charged, and we describe that as an anion. So I usually tell students, a negative ion is an anion. There it is. You gain an electron, remember electron negatively charged, so now you have more electrons than you do protons in the atom. Therefore, now you have an anion. A cation, is where an atom has lost an electron. Now you have more protons than you do electrons. Therefore, it's going to be positively charged. Okay, think about that. Write those definitions down. You will most definitely see those on the exam. All right. So if you have any questions about ions or ionic bonds or covalent bonds or hydrogen bonds, which come, we're gonna come back and talk about hydrogen bonds, please write them down uh, and be sure to ask your uh, classmate, get some tutoring and then uh, jump into the Zoom office hours and ask me. All right, so comparing the different strengths uh, of the bonds, you can see covalent is stronger than ionic which is stronger than hydrogen. That means the stronger the bond, the more energy is required to break it. That means the stronger the bond you have, the more energy is stored within that bond. And we're gonna be talking about that. We have a whole chapter just dedicated to energy and where it's stored uh, in biological uh, molecules and how in turn organisms use those energy molecules that are stored uh, 
in the macromolecules. All right, moving on, we want to talk about chemical reactions. So we have uh, an entire unit that's going to be dedicated to just uh, chemical reactions, biological chemical reactions. So it's really important to understand. And we've gone over this already, and you should know this already. Basically, with chemical reactions, you're either making a bond or you're breaking a bond. And that's it. Uh, when we look at it, reactants go into a reaction. So there's a reactant. And then the products come out of a reaction, and there are the products. So basically, the creation of a bond uh, is going to be A plus B will form AB. And then the breaking of a bond, AB will become A plus B in a reaction. And we're going to talk about this, and we're going to delve into this more in up coming chapters. But just be aware of that. Uh, and again, for those of you that are already seen this in chemistry and remember from high school chemistry, it's basic review for you. All right. So I want to uh, stop here because I know I've talked a lot about uh, the introduction to chemistry and I will pick up on water chemistry uh, in the next video. All right. Take care all.